to worship, I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles. We'll be looking in Psalm 37 in just a few moments. I am, uh, needless to say, thrilled about what God is doing in and through Level College and through the seminary and excited to be here. I'm excited to be able to preach this morning. I always love the opportunity to come and to share with you what God's laid on my heart. And every year, every opportunity that God gives me on Sundays and here in the chapel and throughout the week just to be able to open the Word of God, it's just an incredible and humbling privilege that He has given me. You're all, I'm so thankful you're here. Jana's here today and I always uh, want to give her a shout out to the most uh, wonderful gift that God could ever give me. And was thinking as I was standing on the front row, we are celebrating 35 years of marriage in December, and we have spent uh, most of that right here at New Orleans Seminary, and excited to, that God has given me the chance to walk with her and for us to be together. I love her greatly, and I'm thankful that she's here today. I want you to look at this. I want to talk to you for a few minutes today about directions, specific directions. We know that instructions are important. If you'll notice this on the slide, there was a survey that was done by the Department of Interior. They decided they were going to track the migratory patterns of birds. And so they attached to the legs of the birds tags that had these words which represented Washington Biological Survey. Below this, there was an email address that if you found one of these birds, you were supposed to send a note to let them know that you found a bird and that it was tagged so they could kind of keep up with it. This was all going well until they received the following email from a farmer. Here's what he said. Dear sirs, I shot one of your birds. My wife, now listen carefully, my wife followed the cooking instructions attached. She washed it, she boiled it, and she served it. And I must confess, it was the worst thing we have ever eaten. It's important if we're going to be the people God wants us to be, that we have clear instructions. And the way we discover those clear instructions for our life is to go into the Word of God and to ask God specifically, based upon His Word, how then shall we live? And today, I want to take you to the psalm. I want us to look at Psalm 37. This is a psalm that God has used in my life. As a matter of fact, when I was a student, Dr. Waylon Bailey was talking with me one day as I was walking through a challenging time, and he took me to the passage that Brooke just read a few moments ago and reminded me of the simple truth where David says, I was young and now I'm old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Today, I want us to go to the first part of that passage and to see the specific instructions that God gives. Now, I'll confess to you as we begin, when you walk through this passage, there are a myriad of instructions. I will touch upon a few, and there's two or three more sermons that can come out of this passage at a later time. But here again, the words that, that Brooke read earlier, specifically the words that David read, wrote in the first seven verses of Psalm 37. Listen to what he says. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass, and they'll fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. I'd encourage you, we all have many things on our minds. I would encourage you, if you're able, just to take a piece of paper and jot these instructions down so that as we leave this place, they stay both in our hands, but we can make certain they start and stay within our hearts as well. David is writing this as a testimony. You know David has had high moments and low moments. He has those moments when he was one who could be seen as a man who was seeking God's heart. There were other times in his life where he looks back, and to be honest, he was a miserable failure. He had stepped away from doing what God had called him to do and actually had done contrary to what God willed for his life. 
And yet now as life had gone on, he's looking back and he said, as an older man speaking to younger people, he said, I have some hints for life, some instructions, some directions for how you should live. These are obvious in the passage today. I simply want to remind you of them. First of all, he says this. In verse 1, he begins by saying this, Don't fret because of evildoers. We live in a world which plays upon our emotions and particularly plays upon our fears. And in all honesty, if you watch the news much, if you see what's taking place, you come to a point in your life where you are fearful of everything that's going on. As a matter of fact, it's easy for us to come to the conclusion that Satan may be winning this thing. The psalmist had experienced that. And the psalmist looked around in his world and he said this, I want to remind you that you and I have no reason to fear. We should not fret because of evildoers. I was reminded of the story I read uh, in the newspaper not too long ago in a magazine and it was talking about how there was a survey that was done. You've heard of all these surveys and in the survey what they determined is that shampoo can cause cancer. So the result of it was is that people became fearful. They became fearful and stopped using shampoo. So there were people all over the world not using shampoo. If you read the small print of the study, what you discover is this. For six months, they fed mice. Did you hear the story? They fed mice a diet of shampoo, and the result was the mice got cancer and died. I don't know about you, when I read the story, here's the moral of that story. Don't eat shampoo. (laughs) But there were people who were fearful of what happens if this takes place. What are we going to do? What happens if we can't wash our hair? What should we do? And they began to worry about it. We live in a world in which we are always pulled toward the worry. And David says, instead of being individuals who are concerned, who are fretting over all those evil things that are taking place, We should sit back and think to ourselves, God's got this. God is firmly in control, and because God is in control, because Jesus has already secured the victory for us, both in this life and in the life to come, you and I should be individuals that don't fret. Remember when Jesus met with his disciples, the cross was looming in the very future. And as Jesus understood better than anybody else what was getting ready to take place, Jesus looked at his disciples, and here's what he said. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus was telling them in the midst of everything that's getting ready to happen, both in the present as well as in the future that they had no idea about, they just needed to keep trusting in God. You're going to discover in life and in ministry. You're going to discover in deacons meetings and in personnel committee meetings. You're going to discover all the way through life that there are things that will cause you to have fear. But the scripture says simply this. Don't fear. Don't fret. God is in control. It's the reason that that Peter, in the midst of great persecution, could say in 1 Peter 5, 6, Peter says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. I'm reminded of the story of Elisha that day. He was in the city and the gates were closed and his servant woke up the next morning and walked out and when he saw, he looked around, he saw that they were surrounded. And when he felt that they were overwhelmed, the servant came and spoke to Elisha. And Elisha said, so what's going on? And the servant said, we are surrounded. Essentially what the servant was saying is that we're doomed. You remember what Elisha did? Elisha said, don't fear, don't fret, for those who are with us are more than those who are against us. And then he prayed. He said, Lord, open the eyes of the servant. And the servant walked out. And when he looked, he saw that they were surrounded by armies, but he saw chariots of fire that lined the perimeter behind the army that was to attack him. In ministry... And in life, I would encourage you, don't fret. 
He also goes on in the same verse and he tells us not only are we not to fret, he says uh, we are likewise not to be envious. Specifically, he says this, don't be envious toward wrongdoers. This answers the age-old question of why do the heathen prosper? Have you ever noticed that there are charlatans, even in the religious society or the religious community, that seem to do things that we know without any question are contrary to God's will, and yet they seem to prosper? As a matter of fact, there are sometimes it's frustrating when we hear about their new jets, when we hear about their big houses, their big salaries, and we hear about the places that they preach, and we think, I'm a righteous man, why does God not give that to me? And here's what God says. Don't be envious of them. The things that they've sought after will quickly disappear. And I think what God then says to you and me is he speaks to us directly and he says, you know what? Instead of being envious of those who are wrongdoing, instead of being envious, by the way, even of each other in ministry, here's what God says. Why don't you just be content with what I'm doing in your life? You know what I've discovered? I've discovered that contentment is very difficult. And the reason why is because I think Satan realizes if he can just get us in a state of being discontent, then suddenly we become so consumed with self and we become angry toward God that in the process of it all, we miss what God's trying to do in our lives at the present time. You know the other thing God has reminded me often? God has reminded me that the simple truth that he does anything in my life and anything through my life is really the result of his grace, and I don't even deserve that. So we come to a point where we say, let's quit being envious. He makes it clear in this passage where he says, the very things that we're envious of are the things that are going to pass away. They're not going to last told the illustration the other day at church, and it's an old illustration, you've heard it, but it illustrates it so well. A couple had spent their entire lives on the mission field. They had sacrificed. They came back with poor health. They came back not having any finances, very little security, and they came back in those days on a ship across the ocean. When they got back to port in New York City, they were disembarking from the ship, and when they were leaving the ship, they heard a band that began to stir up. And for a moment, they thought they were being welcomed home. And then they watched in front of them as a politician got off. And the politician was receiving all the praise and all the welcome. And then this man and this woman who had spent every ounce of their energy on the mission field came off that plank down the ship and came and they looked around and there wasn't a single person who greeted them. You can imagine the disappointment. You can imagine the heartache. In the midst of it all, the husband was somewhat frustrated And he said this, he said to his wife, he said, we came home and not one person noticed. We came home and not one person cared. And his wife looked back at him and said, just remember, we're not home yet. You and I have to be at a point where we understand things that people amass here are going to disappear, but what you and I have been called to do is the only thing that's going to last into eternity. The only difference that's going to be made in people's lives is Jesus Christ working through them and allowing us to be a part of his instrument and allowing us to be a part of his ministry. And so let's decide that we're not going to be envious by any of those. He goes on, he says, not only are we supposed to be individuals who don't fret, and not only are we supposed to be individuals who don't envy others, He goes and he continues in verse 3 and he says this, Trust in the Lord and do good. This is easy. As a matter of fact, we say this all the time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. It's easy to say it's more difficult to do. Trust is when we come to a point where we're willing to push aside everything else. All of our desires, all of our plans, all of our thoughts, even all of our best actions. And we say, God, this is about you. And we're going to trust in you. We're going to lean into you. We're going to depend upon you. Bob Vernon was a former uh, L.A. Police Department chief, and one of his jobs was to train the rookies. And during one of those training sessions, he was to impress upon them the trustworthiness of bulletproof vests. And so he put a bulletproof vest on a mannequin, and he 
he cocked his pistol and he shot it. And he shot again, he shot again. Then they went over and they examined it. And they noticed that none of the bullets had pierced that protection. It had worked. And he looked at the guys and and the gals who were the rookies and he said, this is something you can trust. You can trust these bulletproof vests. And then he said, I want everybody who trusts this bulletproof vest to raise your hand. They all raised their hand. Then he said, okay, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go put a bulletproof vest on. So they put a bulletproof vest on, and while they had their back turned to him, he cocked the pistol he was holding. And he said the expressions on their face when they turned around conveyed to him that it was easy to say that they trusted It was a little bit more different to really trust. You and I, and this is a danger because we're in God's work, we're in seminary, we're in level college. We live based upon the fact that we trust in the Lord. But I want to challenge you today to ask the question, do you really trust in the Lord? Do we really rely upon him? Do we really actively say, God, there is no other person that I desire to know more than you. There is no other direction. There's no other encouragement. There's no other uh, instructions for my life. There is no one else that I desire more than you. I trust in you. And it's interesting in this passage because then what he says is this. If you really trust in the Lord, it's going to make a difference. This is the story of James. I'm teaching James in an exegetical class right now. And the the truth of James is simply this. If you say you believe, it's going to make a difference in the way you live. Because he says this, trust in the Lord and do good. Act upon your trust. It's not enough to be hollow. It's not enough for us to all go say, I trust in the Lord. The psalmist said, I've discovered he is trustworthy. I have discovered that you can trust him, and I've also discovered that as you trust him, it impacts how you live. It impacts what you do. Again, my caution to you, my caution for all of us, is that if we're not careful, we can trust in the Lord when it's easy. But when it becomes difficult, if we're not careful, we begin to rely upon our own plans And the facetiousness of this continues to overwhelm me because actually what we're doing is we're saying to God, God, we think that's a good plan, but we've got a better one. Now think of the silliness of that moment. Think of being able to say to God, God, we recognize you as holy, all-powerful, all-present. We know that you're great, but I'm going to choose my plan instead. That's what we do. David says, I've done it. Matter of fact, David, if you'll remember, it's trusting in his plan that led him into a whole host of troubles. Because as he continued to trust in his plan, it took him further and further away from God and further away from what God desired for his life. And there came a point where he had to throw up his arms and say this, God, I have sinned against you and you alone. The reason he sinned against God is because he didn't trust God. He didn't let God have that control of his life. And the psalmist says, quit worrying. Quit being envious. Instead, just trust in God. You'll notice as he continues in this passage then, he has that not only are we supposed to trust in the Lord and do good, but he then goes on in verse 3 and he says this, we are to dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. There's a lot to be said for this. Let me just remind you quickly. Here's what I think David is saying. Don't miss what God is doing where you are at the present time. Now, if, you're just, if you'll just give me permission for just a minute, I just have a quick soapbox I want to stand on. God has called you here for this moment. Yes. He is preparing you for those moments in the future. But as you prepare for those moments in the future, here's what David is saying. Better yet, here's what God is saying to David, through David, to you right now. Dwell here. Dwell in this land. Live now for Jesus Christ. I cringe when I hear people say this. They say things like, 
I can't wait to get out of here. Referring to our city. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, we've lived here most of our lives. Matter of fact, we've lived here longer than any other place. There's a list of things that I would change if I could. But you know what? God, in his omniscience, decided that he was not going to give me the power to change those things. Because he had other things in store for me. So I can drive and I can complain about the roads... And I can drive and I can complain about the levees. And I can do all these things and gripe and gripe and gripe and get at the end of the day and the only thing I've done is list things that I'm unhappy with and God says, do you remember that person you met when you were picking up your dry cleaners? Do you remember your next door neighbor? Do you remember that person you honked at in traffic? Those were all opportunities to demonstrate faithfulness to me as a witness and as a testimony to others. And you've missed them all. It is possible to come here to seminary. It is possible to come here to the college. It's possible to live here and to have an incredible experience and leave this place and make absolutely no difference in this city. And what I would tell you is that if God's called you here, and he's placed you in this city at this time, if you're waiting to get out of here to make a difference, in my humble opinion, you are totally disqualified for ministry. Because God, God doesn't say do it then. He says dwell in the land. Reside here. Inhabit this place. As a matter of fact, you look around our city and you know what you discover? We need people like you. We need people like all of us coming together who are cultivating faithfulness. The words cultivate literally means planting seeds of faithfulness. We need people who are consistently living for Jesus Christ so that others around are going, now I get it. Now I understand what that's about. And so he says to you and I, demonstrate now, live now in this place a faithful life following after Jesus Christ. That's the reason Paul will say, therefore be careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of the opportunities that have presented, been presented in front of you. Remember what the writer, of Proverbs, or the writer of Psalms says? Teach us to number our days. By the way, there's some of you numbering your days. Some of you know the number of days between now and graduation in December. Some of you are really good mathematicians, and you know the number of days between now and graduation in May. That's not what he means. When you number something, you pick it up, and you value it, and you say, this is one day that God has given me. Teach me to number this day for your honor. So, so the psalmist says, Demonstrate faithfulness right here, right now, where you're at. Don't spend all your time looking back. And don't spend all your time looking forward. Look now. Dwell now here. He goes on and he says, not only are we supposed to dwell in the land, he says in verse 4 then, take delight in the Lord. Let the Lord be what satisfies us. The fifth instruction he gives us is simply that. Take delight in the Lord. We live in a, lot of, we live in a city in which there's a lot of things that satisfy people. There's coffee. Uh, there's food. There's food. There's food. Uh, there's food. Uh, we were laughing on a recent trip we were on that, uh, you know, we go to eat at a restaurant. And what do you do at the restaurant? Talk about food. There are festivals, and there are parades, and there's all kinds of stuff in the city. And by the way, there's some things that provide temporary satisfaction that shouldn't be involved in your life. But here's what the psalmist says. The psalmist says this. Find your joy. Find your satisfaction. Take delight in God. Let Him be that which satisfies. And I think this is a constant prayer you and I have to pray. Praise will disappear. Positions will evaporate in front of us. But Jesus Christ is the consistent in our lives. And in Him we can find true satisfaction. And that satisfaction will never change. And it will never disappoint us. 
It's the reason, if you think about it, Paul's under house arrest in Rome and he says this. By the way, what would you be saying in house arrest in Rome? More than likely, we probably would all be bemoaning the fact that we're so good for God, I can't imagine that he left us here. And you know what Paul says? Rejoice in the Lord. Find your satisfaction in the Lord, even in the midst of the prison, even in the midst of the city of New Orleans, even in the midst of challenging classes, Greek tests and Hebrew tests, research and writing, and the list goes on. Those things are opportunities for us to say, regardless, you know what? My joy is in Christ, and nothing satisfies like Him. You know, as well as I do in ministry, when we start allowing other things to satisfy us more than Jesus, our ministry takes horrible turns. We see this over and over again. Men and women place their own desires above a desire for God, and they become bankrupt in life, wasted in ministry. The psalmist says, God, I desire you. Wouldn't you like to be known as a man or a woman after God's own heart? Wouldn't you like to be that person that someone looks at and says, you know what, I don't know much about that person, here, but here's one thing I know. They loved God. They were a child of God. And I knew it not because of a bumper sticker on their car, because, because they wore a name tag, religious jewelry, or appropriate t-shirts. I knew because you just know when you encounter them. The psalmist says, delight yourself. By the way, I'd, I'd encourage you when you look at this, you look at verse 4, you'll notice he says, delight yourself. You know what that's a reminder of? You're going to have to make a decision. As a matter of fact, you're going to consistently have to make the choice about whether you're going to be satisfied with Jesus. And I know that sounds facetious. I know that sounds crazy. But the reality is, is that we're always going to be pulled aside. But he says, delight yourself in the Lord. And by the way, he goes on, he says this, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You know what the problem with that verse is in our understanding? We tell God what we want without first aligning our heart with him and the scripture says when we align our heart with God then suddenly those things that we desire are things that align with his heart and that's what he wants to give us he wants to give you patience and compassion and love and hope but it only happens as he becomes what we long for quickly he goes on in this passage and he reminds us that we're also, also supposed to commit our way to the Lord. In verse 5, he says that, commit your way to the Lord. Make a decision. I always think when God leads me to these passages, uh, I always ask God, God, do you know who I'm talking to? And, uh, and there's a point in time where God says, yes, I do know. And remember, you were there as well. So let me tell you, I can... Speak to you as one who is not only where you've been, I can speak to you as one who is consistently where you are. And here's what he says. Not only do we trust in God, not only do we find our delight in Him, but we come to a point where we say, God, my life is not mine. It is yours. You'll notice he says, commit your way. Commit everything you have to Him. God does not desire half-heartedness. He desires your life. By the way, God does not deserve half-heartedness. There was a time in my life when I wasn't crazy about roller coasters. I got over it, but in Nashville, at the, grew up in Nashville at the uh, State Fair. Uh, they would come to town, and there was a large wooden roller coaster. For those of you who've been here a long time, you'll remember the Zephyr at Six Flags, and perhaps you've been here even longer than that, you'll remember the Zephyr at Pontchartrain Beach. There was a large wooden roller coaster, and I always wanted to ride that. And several times I got in line with my father, who loved roller coasters. And we'd be waiting, and about two-thirds of the way, I'd look at my dad, and I would say, I don't think I can do this. And I'd quickly get out of line. My father loved roller coasters, so it was kind of a frustration for him. 
But I remember a point in time, we're waiting in line, and we're standing there, and people are passing by us. We'd already bought the ticket, and he looked at me, and he said this. If we're going to ride this, we're going to ride this. If we're going to get in line, we're going to do this. And he looked at me, and he asked the question, so are you in? I thought for a moment, there was that flight instinct within me that felt this was the time to run. I didn't want to disappoint my father. So I looked at my dad and I said, I'm all in. And he looked at me and he said, I just want to let you know, when we move inside that turnstile, there is no turning back. And it's interesting. I can remember that was, um, that was about 51 years ago. But I can still hear the click of that turnstile behind me clearly thinking, I'm in this. By the way, I did rode the roller coaster that night, fell in love, always enjoyed it. And here's what God says to you. You're in this. You need to be in this. You need to make a commitment. You need to decide with all of your life that you're going to move forward. We were looking last night at our Bible study at church. And in James chapter 1, verse 5, James says this, A double-minded man is unstable in all his way. If you want your entire life to be shifting sand, then all you need to do is refuse to make a complete commitment to God. The rest of your life, you're going to be trying to catch your balance. Everything you do is going to be unstable. And by the way, when you commit to the Lord, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. When you make a decision to follow after Him as you have, it doesn't mean that it's always just going to be cheery and wonderful, but it's always going to be right. And God is always going to be there with you. So he comes and he says in verse 5, just make a commitment. Commit to the Lord. Act as one who follows the Lord all the time. Better yet, let your actions demonstrate the fact that you're following the Lord all the time. And finally he says this in verse 7. And I must confess in this room, this is probably the most difficult for all of us. The last thing he shows us, the last thing really I want to point out to you this morning is simply this. Here's what he says. Rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord. As a matter of fact, he says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. I think that David had come to realize, like you and I have, we are busy in life. I get in in the morning, one of the first things I do is I pop up my calendar and I see what's taking place this day and Occasionally I have people who write and say, you know, I'd like to see this meeting or can you do this? And I think to myself, I just don't think I can do one more thing today. And that's where we live. That's ministry. That's being a student, by the way. That's life. And David says, I have run from point A to point B and from point B to point C. And I found myself exhausted at the end of the day. And here's what I've discovered. I should have just rested in the Lord. I should have placed myself before him and waited patiently for him. It is possible that you and I are so busy doing good things that we forget that which is most important. If you look back, when Jesus called his disciples in Mark, the scripture says he called them to himself. And listen to this. We, when we feel the call of God, we immediately start going, okay, now I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to preach, I need to teach, I need to witness, do all this. When Jesus called his disciples, it says very clearly, he called the disciples to him first that they might just be with him. So in the midst of doing everything else, he's calling us aside and he's saying, you know what? Don't be envious. Don't fret. Trust in the Lord and do good. Come to a point where you dwell in the land. Take the light in the Lord. Commit your ways. But above everything else, just come before God and rest and wait patiently for him. There's too many times in our life where we have not waited on God. And our lives have been a train wreck. And we discovered if we'd just slowed down long enough to hear God speak, if we'd just 
waited patiently. Do you hear what the psalmist said? I waited patiently for the Lord. In, verse, in Psalm 40, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear toward me. So I encourage you in the midst of great busyness, in college, in seminary, in life, Let's make the seventh instruction the most important instruction. And just wait in the Lord. Rest in Him. Wait patiently for Him to speak. As a professor, many of you have heard me say this before. Just follow the direction. So today I say to you, just follow the directions. Would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that you're a God who hasn't just left us here to wonder and to try to figure things out, but you're a God who is here with us. I pray for my friends who are here, God. I pray that you would give them great grace in their lives. I pray that they would find rest in you that they would wait patiently for you, that they would trust you, that they would not be envious. God, that they would do the very things you've called us all to do in your word. Help for us today, God, just to follow the instructions. For it's in your name we pray.